So one of the things that happens when you are a pastor is that people ask you questions about the Bible. And usually it's the more complicated passages, right? It's not the easy, you know, Jesus wept kind of passages. It's the really complicated ones. And so, and, and I, it's like I almost think people are trying to give you the zinger that you can't answer. I'm just thinking that's kind of a thing. But um, so we're, I'm going to spend a couple weeks talking about uh, what I'm going to call puzzling passages in Scripture that people come and try to zing you with. Um, I do want to mention that next Sunday we do have a guest speaker. Please be here. He is one of my favorites. Uh, Dr. Wilson has been here multiple times. He uh, mentored me, and most of my quirky ideas came from him, so it's his fault. But please be here. Uh, he, is, uh, he is a wonderful man. He'll be here next week. But um, So back to this. So puzzling passages. When you read the Scripture, when I read the Scripture, every once in a while you come, ac- you come across something, you kind of go, hmm? I'm really not sure what that means. And most of us, I think we just kind of skip it and keep on going. It's like, oh, that's confusing. Oh, well, and then we just keep on going. Not realizing how important everything in Scripture really is. If it's in there, I'm sure there's a reason why it's in there, and I believe God wants to use it to speak to you. We, we need to remember the value of the Bible, the value of the, of the Word of God, that Isaiah says this, Isaiah 55 says, that to, says so, so is my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, some versions say void, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The power of the word is that God speaks his word and it goes forth and it, the word, accomplishes what he, God, wants it to do. His purposes are, are completed. So, um, Creation, Genesis, God spoke and there was light. God spoke and there were fish. God spoke and there were plants, right? And so God, when God speaks, his word travels forth and it, it accomplishes something. So when we're reading the scripture and we kind of look at something and go, well, it's kind of weird, and we just jump in and keep on going, we're not allowing that to accomplish God's purposes in our hearts, and that's why we need to stop and, and spend the time and dig. And so um, I, what, basically what I'm going to share out of Luke 16 this morning is something that someone recently asked me, hey, what is this? And it's like, okay, if I'm really honest, that's one of those passages that I kind of skipped over because I looked at it and I thought, that's really squirrely. I don't understand. And I just kind of blew, blew past it. And because I was asked, I had to circle back and go, oh, I should really figure this out. So in the figuring out, I thought, you know, I'm going to share this with you guys and see what we come up with. And let's have some fun with it, all right? So puzzling passages, go with me to Luke 16. I'm going to read the part that's puzzling, and then we'll back up and put it in context. Does that sound fair? So Luke 16, I'm going to read verses 8 and 9, and then we'll back up. It says, the master commended the dishonest manager. Well, that's weird. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people than are the people of light. Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. What? So I think that what, what that's telling me is I should give Brandon 20 bucks so he'll be my friend. I'm fairly, no, maybe not. But so, so when, we, when we look at that in just by itself, we go, wow, Jesus is saying that if you cheat, you're cool. And I want to just, like, before you get distracted and go, oh, he told me to. No, that's not what it's trying to say. But let's put this in context and figure out what the Lord is saying because it's in here and, and, and as the way I read it, it like includes almost the entire chapter. 
So why is this in here and what is God trying to speak to us? So the story is, starting in verse 1, there's a rich guy who has apparently lent money out to people. Sort of like the, uh, the farm credit union, if you will. So, like, even here in Bullitt County, the farmers go down to, what's the bank downtown, the Ag, Ag South, right? They go down to Ag South, and they're like, you know, hey, this year we're going to plant, you know, a thousand acres, so we need to borrow blah, blah, blah amount of money. You know, we need to borrow a million dollars to get this tractor working. Those tractors are expensive. If you want to see really cool tractors, by the way, first Friday is Ag Night Out this week. You can go down there. They'll have big tractors downtown. You can climb on them, and it's fun. But, but anyway, um, as an advertisement for my wife. Um, so, the, um, so they borrow money for, for tractors and seed and whatever, and they harvest it. And, and so, like, I've talked to one of the farmers that's down uh, Pretoria Rushing Way, and, you know, and he's like, yeah, we borrow $4 million, Bullet County, and we, we do our, our crop season, and we're hoping that, that we, will, we will bring in like four and a half to five million dollars so we can pay the bank off and have a little bit left over. And I thought, my goodness, you have way more faith than I do. Because I'm like, you know, I'm scared out of my mind to borrow money to buy a house. And these guys are borrowing money, and the hurricane comes, goodbye. And so, so that's, the, that's the scene. Look with me then in Luke chapter 16. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions, and so he called him in and he asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer, also known as you are fired. Verse 3, the manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. The light bulb came on. And so he called in each of the master's debtors, those who had taken the loan from the master, and he asks the first, how much do you owe my master? Well, I owe 900 gallons of olive oil which would be like, you know, just a huge field of olive trees. And the manager says to him, okay, sit down, take your bill, sit down quickly, and instead of being 900, make it 450. 50% discount. Okay, just, I just want you to picture, right, you owe the bank $100,000 for your house, you go into the bank, and the guy says, hey, just make it 50 Hey, that's a pretty good deal. I'm liking it. And then he asked the second, how much do you owe? And he goes, well, I owe a thousand bushels of wheat. And he says, take your bill, make it 800, 20% discount. Which they're probably happy, but what's the master thinking? You done robbed me. You have cheated me. You have robbed me. By modern standards, you should go to jail. By Old Testament standards, you should be stoned to death outside the city. You have done wrong. Then we get to the verse I already read to you. But the master comes in, and the master commends him. He praises him. Hey, dishonest lying manager, well played. Gosh, this is so confusing. Well played, because you acted shrewdly. The people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of light. Who are the people of light? Us. So Jesus is saying, are those red in your, are those letter words red in your Bible? Those who still have paper Bible? Thank you for having a paper Bible. You rock. Good job. Well, you guys have your e-Bibles. I don't know if you're like playing, you know, some game or actually reading. Your anyway, thank you for having a paper Bible. This is a, not an e-Bible. This is a tree Bible. So you are shrewd in dealing. So verse 9, Jesus says, I tell you, now here's the instruction. 
I tell you, use your worldly wealth, money, to gain friends for yourselves. So that when it's gone, it being your worldly wealth, you will be welcomed into not their houses, but an eternal house. Now, how many of you guys kind of look at this and go, well, that's really weird. That's kind of a squirrely little passage. And so looking at it, I think the things we need to, we need to consider, and we'll keep reading in a minute, but the things we need to consider are that the, the dishonest manager was using what we would call the principle of reciprocity. Give, and it will be given unto you. The only problem is that he was giving something that really wasn't his to give. Because it's, it's a lot easier to be generous with someone else's pocket. Right? I mean, you know, if I was giving an offering out of Brandon's wallet, I'd probably give more. Right? It's easier because, yeah, whatever. Which is probably part of the problem. We have government spending problems. Not to get political or nothing, but they're spending my money buying $16 muffins and $500 hammers. And nobody's going to do that if it's their own money. Truth? Okay. Sorry. Didn't mean to go there, but I did. Um, so the question then is, why is Jesus calling this lying cheating, dishonest guy, good? That's the question that we need to answer. We will answer before you leave, so anxiety is gone, okay? Let's read the next couple of verses, and will help us figure it out. Verse 10. Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. Stop there. So we've already established that this guy, that Jesus is saying, use your worldly influence to affect your future. Right? Isn't that what the guy did? He used his worldly influence to affect his future and Jesus is saying, verse 9, that we need to use our worldly influence, finances, to affect our eternal future. Not the job you're going to get, but the place you're going to reside eternally. Because one day your it, your money, your influence will be... And it'll be what you have done that will affect where you will be. Does that make sense? So our eternal home is affected by our attitudes and actions here with our worldly wealth. Don't be afraid. We're not going to receive an offering. Don't be freaking out, okay? Just trying to, try to educate us. So if I, if I look at my money and I say, it's my money, wait, we'll just do this. It'll be more fun. I'll see what my wife left me. Okay, I got $65. Let's say that this is my paycheck. If I look at all this and I go, this is mine, I'm rich. Right? I can go buy like six coffees and a muffin, all right? Okay, not really, maybe more. But, you know, if I look at this and I, whoa, this is me, 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 then God looks at that and goes, mm-hmm. It is all about you, is it not? But if I look at this and I go, wow, look, I can give and I can help and I can save and I can honor you with this because you've given me something that has influence. So that's a totally different attitude, is it not? Right? I can, if I walk around and I got $60 and I see, I see that, that, that Henson's sitting here and she's like, and she's, I haven't eaten in four days. <laughs> right? Then I can go, well, here, here, honey, go, go buy yourself. <laughs> there you go. Take it. Thank you. We did not practice this. <laughs> go, go buy yourself something. And then I go, God, Father, you're so awesome. Thank you for allowing me to have influence in her life and be a help to her. Right? So then later on, if you know, I need a, a 
job reference, is she going to say, I'm a nice guy? All right. If I need a character reference, is she going to come and go, oh, he's a nice man, he was giving. If, if, if God's going, hey, who should I promote in the kingdom, who's it going to be? Oh, that guy's stingy. He doesn't give nobody nothing, man. He just... Or is he going to look at me and go, oh, he's got a, he's got a giving heart. He's open. He's, he's generous towards people. He cares about people because I showed that I cared. God's going to look at it and go, ah, I'm going to give that guy a promotion in the kingdom. Does that make sense? Does it see how this works? Okay, so our eternal home is affected by how we handle wealth and influence here. There's a joke, this is a joke, about the man who dies and goes to heaven and Peter meets him at the proverbial pearly gates, right? And, you know, oh, get, you know, gets his name, lets him in, and, you know, has the address of his heavenly mansion. And so they go walking and there's streets of gold and big, huge houses. And it's like, woo! And the guy's excited and they take a turn and then they're on these silver roads and they're really cool. And the house is a little, house is a little more modest. And, you know, and it's like, you know, that's still pretty nice. It's heaven. I'm excited to be here. And they turn at another corner and, you know, and, and the roads are bronze. And, yeah, it's, it's okay. It's a little, you know, little bitty houses and, and they turn the road and there's like gravel and dirt and they get to a cardboard box and, and Peter's like here you go and the man's like but those really pretty houses on streets of gold and Peter's like man we did the best we could with what you sent ahead <laughs> ding <laughs> Still in Luke, Luke 12 says this. I'm going to read verses 30 through 34. It says, The pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows what you need. But seek first the kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Don't be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not fail, where no, no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Verse 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is it not true that we're all pretty much focused in on our treasure? We are, we, our heart is on our treasure and where you put your treasure is where your heart is right if you keep all your money in a shoebox in the bedroom if anyone goes snooping around the bedroom you get a little anxious right because they're going to find all my money it's hidden in the bedroom it's in the shoebox right I said, mm -hmm. put it in the bank Shh, just, just a thought we should realize that what, that, what this passage just told me in chapter 12 is that God knows what you need. I think we kind of prayed about that earlier. You know, if you need to pay your light bill, God knows that. If you need groceries, God knows that. If you've got a bunch of little kids that need clothes, let them run around naked. No, just kidding. If you've got little kids that need clothes, God knows that. And God is aware of your needs, and God desires to provide for your needs. Scripture says so. In fact, if you're at a place where you're in a pinch, go back to Luke 12, 30 through 34, and pray over that. And say, God, this is what the Word says. The Word says that I, I should be more concerned about kingdom things than I should be about natural things. And in fact, I'll just go ahead and throw this out. This is free. A lot of times we get ourselves into our own trouble because we get stuff that we really shouldn't have and we can't afford it and we're paying for it and we can't afford the food we need. Smile, I just helped you. <laughs> I can't afford this and I can't afford that and I can't afford that. Well, you don't really need those. You just wandered into those because you thought it was a great idea and you got yourself into a pinch. Just saying, just trying to help. Okay, so back to, back to our text here. 
Father looks at how you handle financial resources and he looks at your heart in connection to it. If we're back in Luke 16, verse 10, if he can trust you with a little, he can trust you with a lot. Which means to me that if I am untrustworthy with my $65, why in the world would God give me $6 million? I need to learn how to manage this so I can manage that. Isn't it truth that most people that win the lottery end up broke again? Because they don't know how to manage their money. They get themselves in trouble. It's like one in a million to win and it's about another one in a million to manage it right. We need to learn how to manage what we have and as we are trustworthy, it'd be, it'd be like if you had a little kid that like, you know, hey, you know, let me have this toy and, and they break it. One year we, for Christmas, we bought Ian a, um, was it like a little helicopter drone or something? Is that what it was? Like a little, you know, fly little helicopter, a little plastic thing. And it didn't make it till lunchtime. <laughs> Not because Ian wrecked it, but because perhaps an older male sibling whose name shall remain nameless, perhaps he wrecked it. <laughs> I'm not trying to point out anybody particularly, but you know. It's okay, buddy. Sorry. <laughs> so, should we get him one? No, because he's already showed that he can't handle one. Does that make sense? And I think it's the same way in the kingdom. God says, man, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a good job. And, you know, and you're going to get a good paycheck. And then you go and you get yourself deep into debt, squander it, and do all kinds of dumb stuff. And then you're like, God, help me. And God's like, really? Really? If you show yourself to be faithful with little, then you can be trusted with much. Our integrity, this is important, our integrity isn't based on the quantity that we manage. It's based on the heart condition that we have. If you can manage a hundred bucks, then God will be like, okay, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll let you have some more. But if you can't manage a hundred bucks, and it would be harmful to you. It would, God would be being a bad dad to give you more. Because you would buy a fast car and wreck it up against a tree. Does that make sense? Hey, let's do verse 11. 16, 11 says, So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, you will, tr you will, I'm sorry, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Which begs questions like, how do you treat the property where you rent? How do you treat rental cars? My wife used to work for a guy. I can't remember his name, but anyway, it doesn't matter. He would rent a rental car and take it out to the local drag strip on Friday night and drag race his Hertz rental car. And in lane two, in the green Taurus, we had it. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine? And then, the, and then, you know, you'd like pray, God, give me good stuff. He's like, really? You drag race the rental cars. Give me a break. Let's grow up a little bit. Let's get some integrity. Let's get a little maturity. And when you can handle stuff, then we'll let you handle stuff. The important thing is that the true riches... Verse, end of verse 11. Who will trust you with true riches? Hear me. This is not true riches. Okay? This is, what's this guy's name? Jackson and Lincoln. This is not true riches. True riches is kingdom stuff. 
It's your, it's your talents, your abilities, your anointing, the Word of God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's, it's where you serve. It's how you serve. It's the people God's put on your heart and given you a passion to reach out to. Those are the true riches. The true riches are how many people are you bringing into the kingdom? The true riches are I have this ability and I'm going to give it to God and see what he can do with it. That's a true rich. Richness, rich something another. Does this make sense? We spend all of our life chasing these guys. But I'm telling you, a living Savior is better than a dead president. Okay? We need to chase after the true riches. And God is, he's basing, and, and Roy and I did not discuss, but that parable of talents was awesome. The, we, he bases how much he blesses you with on how you do with what you've got. And if you mishandle and fumble what you got, then why in the world would he give you more? Just to watch you fumble it again. Is it making sense for anybody? True riches. So we need to start chasing after true riches, which are kingdom-oriented, which are about our eternal dwelling, not money, money, money. The funny thing is, you can lose this junk. You can lose that. Verse 13. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, really, that is kind of a ridiculous proposition, if you will. Back in the day, just I mean, imagine that you're a servant, and there's two bosses given two contradictory directions. Right? Hey. I want you to go out and work in the field. Hey, I want you to go clean my clothes. Right? I mean, do you see the problem? Work in the field. Why aren't you on the field? Because I'm cleaning the clothes. Well, who told you to clean the clothes? Well, he did. Well, I told you to go do that. And there's this fight. And you cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve this guy and serve that guy. Pick. We have to learn to choose. Which one will we serve? You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot eat at Dunkin' Donuts every day and get in shape. Okay? You cannot be a servant and selfish at the same time. Right? You cannot be faithful and a cheater simultaneously. There's a lot of things you can't. You cannot serve two masters. And Jesus is saying, if you serve the money instead of serving the Father, that you are disqualified. Two more verses. Verse 14. So the Pharisees who are standing there listening to all this, who loved money, heard all this, and they were sneering at Jesus. They were upset. And he said to the Pharisees, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your... See, that's the important part right there. God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Now, I know that you need money to work in this world, right? You cannot go over to the George Power and go, hey, you know what? I went to church this week. Would you forgive my, my power bill? They're going to go, nope, yeah. right? You can't go over to the Walmart Better, you can't go over to the Aldi's and pick out food and go, hey, I'm nice, can I have this for free? I know it doesn't work that way, right? So we need money, but our money doesn't need to be our boss. If your wallet is your master, 
you're messed up. If your obedience to the Lord is based on your wallet, you're, you're making a mistake. Where, where if God says to you, give Megan $20 to buy her food, and your answer is, well, I mean, I've only got a couple, then that's a problem. Because your answer should be, only 20? How about I take her to the grocery store and just buy her more? That should be our, our heart, because our heart should be to serve God and have our money serve God. Okay? I serve the Lord, and Mr. Hamilton, and, or Jackson, sorry, in my possession also serves the Lord. Mr. Lincoln, in my possession, also serves the Lord. They didn't let me have a Franklin, so I don't know about this. But, you know. And when we justify our heart problem with money before the Lord, he calls it detestable, which is pretty strong words. Now, I think it's related that in this same chapter, and we're not reading it today for time, but in this same chapter, we have a fairly long parable about the rich man and Lazarus that follows right after this. Hey, if you serve money and you don't serve people, if you're all about your stuff and you're not about the kingdom, then you're, you're missing it. It's followed by the rich man and Lazarus, which is a great story, which I give you to read for homework, which is that there's a rich guy and he takes care of himself and there's a poor man outside his gate who he ignores totally. And in eternity, the rich man is suffering in hell and Lazarus is in a place of blessing. And the rich man's like, whoa, how did this happen? And the answer is, well, because you had a lot and you ignored the guy who needed it. So he suffered here on earth. He's going to do okay for eternity. Because you suffered zero on earth, you will suffer for eternity. That's the rich man and Lazarus story. You can read it later for your enjoyment. So here's the deal. I'm going to close this up. This passage is complicated, but it does not justify cheating or stealing. What this passage is telling us is that we need to honor God and help others with our influence and with our finances and with our abilities. All of that belongs to Father and we should give it to Him. And He will direct people. I believe with all my heart that there are people in the world that have needs, that are praying, saying, God, I just need this one thing. And God goes to somebody and goes, hey, would you go take care of that? And we go, la, 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 la. And he goes to the next guy, hey, would you go take care of that? And we, and we go, la, 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 la. Hey, would you go take care of that? I don't have time for that. I'm too busy. I'm, I'm chasing Benjamins. And then that person's sitting over there going, well, I guess God ain't real. It's not that God's not real, it's that we're not. We're not being obedient. We're missing the opportunity to be his hands and his feet and to minister to people and help people. And in our community, in our country, in our world, there are all kinds of people that have all kinds of ridiculous needs. And we're just sitting here going... I wish I had a bigger TV. I need a bigger TV. My 70-inch flat screen, 4,000K, ain't good enough. Is that what they call this? Did I say it wrong? Okay, I'm sorry. Anyway. <laughs> My big screen TV is not big enough. Why people are dying of starvation. Why people are going to hell because we don't have time to go tell them about Jesus. Is this making sense? And he's saying, guys, look, if you, if you are the, the dishonest steward, you would realize that you have no control or ability to handle your future. You better use what you have so that your future will be taken care of. And you and I are not getting into heaven because we're handsome or pretty. Some of you might get close, but some of you... 
We're, the only way we're getting in is by, by being people that give our hearts to Christ and entirely give our hearts to Christ so that when he says, hey, I want you to help that person, I want you to go to the mission field, I want you to be a missionary to Africa, that we say, yes, sir. Because when he says, do this, and we go, eh, then we're telling him that our hearts aren't really his. We're just cultural Christians. We're not real Christians. It's not okay to steal and cheat. It's not. But it's also not okay to think that you're going to be cool just the way you are and you can handle this on your own. And if you have a brain, it's really God's. Let him tell you how to use it. And if you have a career, it's really God's. Let him tell you how to use it. And if you, you have a degree, it's really God's. Let him tell you how to use it. And if you have an, a work ethic, it's really God's. Let him tell you how to use it. And if you have finances, they really belong to God. Let him tell you how to use it. If you have stuff, don't let the stuff have you. They're really God's. Let him tell you how to use it. If you have time, it's not really yours. It belongs to God. Let him tell you how to use it. If you have strength, it's not really yours. It really belongs to God. Let him tell you how to use it. At the end of the day, here's my final, 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 final thought. You are blessed to be a blessing. We live in the most blessed, affluent, easy street country on the planet. And be thankful for it. It's, it's, it's great. If you've never traveled overseas, please do. See the rest of the world. I'm excited to be going to Cuba with a couple of you guys in, in December. We're going, to see, we're going to see some poverty. We're going to come back and we're going to go, man, we got it good here. But you know what? It's not about having it good here. It's about being blessed to be a blessing. And when you get that, when, that, when, that is, when that's here, everything changes. I'm blessed to be a blessing. My refrigerator is, food, is full of food. Who can I invite over to feed? I have money for gas. Who doesn't? Who can I help? I have a brilliant mind and I can do great things. How can I take that and turn that around to help in the kingdom? I love to bake brownies. Let me use that for evangelism. Right? Where are you, Gene? Brownie evangelism. Right? If you want to practice brownie evangelism, the office is open at 9 o'clock every morning. You can change. So. Whatever you have that's a blessing is so that you can be... Let's stand our feet. I want you to repeat after me. I am blessed to be a blessing. I am blessed to be a blessing. I am blessed, I am blessed, to, be blessing. Am blessed to be a blessing. All right. Father God, I just thank you today in the name of Jesus. I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can dig into your word and it is life to us. I pray, Father God, that these thoughts and these scriptures would impact our hearts, that we would be changed forever. I thank you that you love us. And, Father, you've put us into a, a beautiful community like this so that we can be a blessing. Open our eyes to see those who are hurting. Open our eyes to see those who are in need. Open our eyes to see those who are struggling just to keep their heads above water. Father God, that we can reach out to them and we can be a blessing. Father, I thank you for it. I ask you to radically transform the way we think. In Jesus' name.